what a spectacular morning it is and great to be up half an hour earlier I hope nobody's late for the safari and we are already hot on the trail of a male leopard in all likelihood Tingana just decided to come into this area to stop and listen because often listening can be one of the best methods of helping you to find a game like lion and leopard my name is Scott and I'm teamed up with Jean-Dre on camera Tara and Nikki on the final control room and sadly Jamie's having a few issues with her vehicle so they're trying to troubleshoot that so you'll be stuck with me for the initial part of the drive but let's carry on we've been here for about five minutes and haven't heard anything we have had tracks of like I say a male leopard and because we did have reports of Tingana heading into this area yesterday afternoon I'm guessing it could be him that coupled with the fact that at the moment he is the dominant male of this territory And thanks very much to Chris Rogue, who sent through a report saying she actually heard a leopard calling on the Juma Dam cam at about 3 o'clock this morning. So that was an all likelihood him, and it's great that we've now got a kind of ballpark idea of how far we are behind him. His last tracks were heading straight up the Vuyatela Access Road before veering west into this general direction. It was still dark at that stage and I was using my, my flashlight to follow the tracks. Not easy going, but we're going to move back into that area now and just double check. Maybe he's sleeping on a termite mound nearby or possibly he's made a kill. Let's take a closer look straight up ahead of us here. Now this bird is going to provide us with some serious entertainment. Possibly not this morning, but definitely in the coming weeks and months it's got a very diagnostic call that sounds like a champagne cork being ejected from the bottle. Oops! Now let me see, I'll just do it once to see if I can't try and urge it to give us one of these calls. Look at how it's creeping through the grass. Anyway, its call goes something like this. Watch closely. Looks like he might do it. Come on. He's doing it. I think he's going to do it. He's definitely thinking about it. I haven't heard them doing it yet, so it's a little bit early on in their breeding season. But maybe we'll get lucky. He's definitely thinking about it. That was me again, obviously. When it starts pivoting its head from side to side, that's a good indicator that it's about to do the call. But usually they'll actually climb up onto termite mounds, get a point of elevation when doing these calls. And let's not force the issue, but mark my words, in the coming weeks we are going to get to see this bird performing its wonderful call. And we're also going to get to see its cousin who's already started calling very loudly and very insistently and that's the red crested Korhan. This is the black bellied, bellied busted. Both very similar looking birds. The black bellied busted has got this black stripe up its throat as you can see now whereas the Korhan lacks the black stripe all the way up the throat and its call is very different. This so a nice difference to earlier on when you started the dri drive with us and isn't this just spectacular we're going to have to monitor this as the morning progresses and it's a cool crisp morning about 17 degrees celsius 62 degrees fahrenheit very gentle breeze blowing and other than the clouds we're looking at now there's not much up in the sky maybe two-eighths
cloud cover this morning. And I'm sure a lot of you are already appreciating being out this half an hour earlier. I certainly am. While we were all in the garages this morning, about to leave, we were all saying how oh, it's a bit of an adventure now that we head out in the dark. Genevieve in New York. Good to have you on board. Genevieve's interested to know what differences we could expect to see in the both the nocturnal and diurnal animals by being out this half an hour earlier. And basically, Genevieve, we've just got a bigger chance of seeing any nocturnal animals still out and about as well as simply just finding more animals active. Especially the predators who are more likely to be active in the earlier hours of the morning. And as it progressively gets later, our chances will decrease drastically in terms of finding animals on the move. So, it's definitely the right thing to be doing, I think using our time most effectively. Although ideally we would be out all day, every day, but that would require a team, I guess, four times the size as the current one, which is not feasible at the moment. But certainly something to work for and work towards. Just to keep you all in the loop, the tracks we had of this male leopard were about a quarter of a mile up ahead of us and they were heading in a north and westerly direction. They then veered off the one road towards this road that we're driving along now, but I would only expect to find its tracks about a couple of hundred meters ahead of us. So I'm just going to be checking very carefully. It's a strange time of the morning in terms of tracking all a difficult time because when I turn the vehicle lights on now you can see it has very little effect on the road therefore not casting enough lights onto the tracks to be able to see them and because the sun isn't up yet we also don't have any help from the sun and in flat light which is essentially what we're in now it's incredibly tricky to spot tracks so let's hope that we spot the leopard instead, lying up in one of these marula trees that we're driving through. It's a wonderful marula grove, this, and lots of comfortable branches for Tingana to be perched on, or to have whatever he may have been lucky enough to kill perched on. take it slowly here and try my best to make sure we don't miss any tracks. <clears throat> so he was just off to our right when he veered off a road running parallel to us and we should have his tracks popping out here somewhere. to Gilly all the way in Wisconsin and
really would like to know if we see another cousin of both the Cory Busted and, uh, sorry, of the Red Crested Corhan and the Black Belly Busted. And that bird is the Cory Busted, which, for those of you who don't know, because I've got the book open and ready, I may as well show it to you quickly. It's a massive bird, quite prehistoric looking, about three or four times the size of the individual we saw earlier. And it stands just over one and a half, or well, about one and a half meters in height, so quite tall. And sadly, Gilly, we do not see them here very frequently. They prefer large open grasslands. But in the Kruger National Park, not far from here, around an area called Satara, there are many of these, as well as secretary birds. And they do have a wonderful call, don't they? That's one of Gilly's favorite calls, the call of the Cory Busted. But we will see them infrequently here in the Sabi Sands. What has this leopard done? Good news is Jamie is up and running and she would like to say good morning to all of you. See you a bit later. Ah. Oh. <laughs> good morning everybody and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. There was a skin book there about two seconds ago. It is now dashed away into the bushes. It sat there, it was lying tucked away in the grass for a good two minutes before vanishing away. You might have seen the flash of it disappearing. Anyway, whilst Scott tracks leopards, I'm on my way to Sydney's dam, just on the other side of the Buffleshook boundary. I want to see if I can follow up on those Salala pride from yesterday afternoon, see if we can figure out where they went, and hopefully, fingers crossed, that they managed to get a meal last night because they were looking quite thin and quite hungry. And for those of you who might have missed yesterday's sunrise, or sunset safari, we found the Salalas just in the corner by a Gauri gate. One member short, unfortunately. It seems as though that young male has definitely disappeared. Most likely been killed, and most likely by the Birmingham. I'm going to go and see if we can locate the rest of the pride. <laughs> Fortunately, our steer book didn't want to be viewed. And we're out half an hour earlier, which always comes with a sense of serious excitement. I don't know, Scott and I share the same feeling. That there's nothing like being out in the morning as early as possible, just for the first rays of light, to try and see what's out there. There's a sense of expectation that you don't get at any other time of the day. Just wondering what sagas have unfolded during the night and what animals are making their way back home after an evening of prowling. I know Scott's on the trail of a male leopard, probably Timbana. I want to find out what happened to those lions last night. It was a big herd, there were actually two big herds, two big herds of buffalo on Arethusa. One set moved west away from the Arethusa Dam last night. The other set we think moved east towards Juma and onto Juma, which bodes very well for us because if they were sitting Red Dam. You guys have seen those enormous buffalo herds that we get, and you've also seen the puddle that is left of Red Dam. So it's unlikely that they were going to get enough water from there, which is why I'm heading across to Sydney's now. I want to find out if that's where they were heading. And we raced back yesterday after a little bit of time spent with Shadow. We raced back across to see if we could catch up with the Salalas, but unfortunately arrived just a little bit too late and they'd moved off. Luckily, because they are in the corner, we should be able to find their tracks pretty easily. Either coming into Bokusuk or Simabili, or, fingers crossed, sticking around somewhere on Juma. I know Scott would have been updating you on the Birmingham boys' movements from last night. And I'm sure we're all hoping that this time the Salalas managed to avoid them. As I said, we suspect that it was one of the Birmingham boys that killed that young male. It was the male with the injured hip. When we first saw him a couple of weeks ago when I was with Brian, he 
had a big hole in the dent of his of his sort of buttocks area around his tail and he was definitely moving a lot slower than the others quite a serious pronounced limp and I think when it came down to a confrontation he was the one that just couldn't get away well I head across to find out what happened at Sydney's dam has found a very large pachyderm to show you, not a leopard, but a pachyderm. So let's head across to him for now and I'll be back with you. What a beautiful morning it is. The sun's just poked up over the bank of clouds to the east. And that was as we stumbled across this elephant bull. He seems to be alone, which is not strange. And he seems very, very relaxed with us and enjoying nibbling on this thorny acacia tree. The birds are beginning to call and the bush is coming alive. Still no sign of the leopard we're looking for. But I'm hoping that's going to change. forward ever so slightly. Try and get you into a bit of a gap. incredible how easily they break these branches with their trunks. If we were to try and do that with our hands it would be not nearly as effective for a number of reasons. Our hands aren't as nearly as tough and as thick skinned as the trunk and they aren't quite as strong as the elephants. And it's just sampling other little plants now alongside the acacia, mixing up its diet. And what it did there was just kind of brush the roots of the plant that it had just plucked out against its trunk, thus ridding it of any sandy particles. Now it's using its tusk to help in stripping all the leaves off this tree. This is going to be awesome. Watch how all the leaves collect in its trunk. And it's also flattening the thorns by doing that. So clever technique. And what it's probably going to do is break this branch now with all the thorns that have been flattened in one direction. Again, just using its tusk to help break the branch. And now it can chew on that branch without worrying about being spiked in the palate or in the lips. Although still seems like one or two must surely be poking it in the mouth. Incredible. They are such calming animals to watch, especially when they're in a mood like this. Here it goes, flattening the thorns again. It's going to be losing a little bit of leaf matter as it does that, but interestingly enough, sometimes they'll actually feed on the leaves that collect in their trunk when performing the thorn flattening technique. What I love about watching elephants 
throughout the year is that they will continually feed on different plants and find the kind of flavor of the month. This morning it's the flaky bark acacia which seems to be the tastiest. It's now sampling a bush willow. Will it have any to eat? Thinking about it. Yeah, it's committed. Now generally the trees with the big leaves with the thorns aren't the most nutritious and aren't fed on as much as the thorny trees which have got this built-in defense mechanism to try and prevent herbivores from feeding on them. But quite clearly this bush willow has got some minerals or nutrients that the thorn trees don't have. And Jeanre is doing some incredible camel work. Look at all of the hairs on its trunk there. And it's very close to us now, very, very close. To the point where it almost become difficult for Jeanre to film. He's not going to be able to zoom out much more than this. And isn't it incredible how close we can be to these animals without affecting them? It's completely comfortable with us. And what a treat, what a great way to start the safari. It's decided to come right up to us and enjoy another one of these flaky bark acacia trees. It's going to be a good opportunity again for Jean Ray to maybe at least try and get you close to, or closer than you've ever been to an elephant before. And at this rate, we might even be able to see straight down its mouth, who knows. Ah, this is awesome. And Angie in Ohio has just made a comment that shame this poor elephants must have a hard time processing all these thorns that would prickle it, kind of prickle its insides all the way down to its stomach. And you're right, Angie, you wonder how it's not more painful than it is and how they manage to go ahead with it but I guess they're a lot tougher than us in many regards and its teeth which are very large slabs essentially like our molars do an incredible job of grinding and flattening a lot of the vegetation that goes into their mouth so those massive plate like teeth I'm sure I'm going to break down those thorns to a point where it's easy to swallow. Well, I think that little tree was born this year. It's not very big at all, but that's the elephant's role. If there was no elephants in this area, it would be a very thick forest. Which would mean a lot of the animals that do live here wouldn't have a suitable habitat to live in. So, it's a necessary destruction. And they feed on huge amounts of vegetation every day. A bull of this size could eat as much as 200 kilograms, 400 pounds of vegetable matter every single day. And if it wasn't for all these elephants, you could imagine how different Africa would be. Okay, now I'm just going to try and reposition again. Out of him. <coughs> Come on, Jigga. There we go. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. There's good news. It looks to be a bigger, even older bull. Off to our right there. So let's head across to that one and have a look what he's up to and as I said when he first came across this alley it's not uncommon for 
them to move alone. Equally, it's not uncommon for them, hello boy, to move in small bachelor herds. Having a bit of a nightmare here, not picking the right pathways to drive along. And this bull is kind of got a little bit agitated with us, nothing serious at all. Oh, what's going to happen here? Is he going to break this branch for us? Yep. Incredible power. And bachelors are usually made up of not always, but usually made up of a combination of young bulls and old bulls. And they come and go, they don't have to stay together. It's not as, as, as tight a bond as a coalition of male lions. And usually, whenever any of those bulls within the bachelor herd come into must, they'll usually separate from the bachelor herd and go off on a rampage looking for ladies. We've got a bit of a roadblock at the moment. We can't get to the elephant, which is just off behind this individual. It's probably going to pop into frame as this elephant takes one or two steps forward. But we're in no rush. We'll just stay here for the time being until we get a gap. And then go and check out the other one. Well, one thing I love about Safari Live is that people are enjoying the show from around the world in different time zones. Barbara's busy eating her dinner and loving the fact that while she eats dinner, she's enjoying watching this elephant eat its breakfast. We might be able to squeeze behind this individual now and go and check out the other one. a little bit about the dentition of the elephant and Sean and Secunda would like to know a little bit more about that and how many teeth will an elephant have in their lifetime well Sean they've got two sets of tusks the first set of tusks referred to as milk tusks are tiny and are barely visible before they fall out and then the second set of tusks start growing and in terms of their teeth you get about a, you get six sets of teeth that will grow in an elephant's lifetime and what happens is they grow kind of like they're on a railway track and each tooth comes in from the rear to replace the other tooth that's worn down in front and once those six sets of teeth have all been used then that will be generally the start of the demise of that elephant because obviously without teeth it's difficult to process all this hard vegetation let's take a close look at this bull he's a serious character with very raggedy ears easy to distinguish from other elephants and I'm wondering if this isn't the elephant bull that Jamie wasn't with the other day. I can already see that his back right leg 
There seems to be something wrong there, and I know Jamie was chatting about an elephant bull that had a kind of dislocated hip, it appeared like. So I'm not sure if any of you were on Safari with Jamie when that happened, and you can confirm that this is in fact the same bull. I'm guessing it is. I haven't seen him walk yet, but just by the way, he's standing. He's very delicately trying to break the branches again. This is a very thorny tree called the buffalo thorn. With hooked thorns, straight thorns. And requires some delicate maneuvering of the trunk to get that into the mouth and onto those big plate-like teeth. Their latter name, Loxodonta. Africana also has a relation to its teeth. Loxodonta means angled tooth. And they've got very big ridges on their molars that help to grind up. Oh yeah, shame. This is definitely the elephant with the hip problem. As he moved there ever so slightly, I noticed quite clearly that He has got a problem with that right leg. Nothing too serious though, because he's still in good condition. It just means it's probably a little bit more difficult for him to move than other elephants. But thankfully, he's not gonna need to run away from predators. And highly unlikely that any predator is big enough to attack a bull of this size, even a very large pride of lions. What it may have an impact on is mating. I don't think he's going to be able to compete with males and or even be able to mount a female if he was successful in a battle over ladies. So maybe he's going to have a bit of a lonely life regarding the ladies, but at least he's got some male companions, one not too far behind us. I'm also interested to know if there were any other elephants around when Jamie was viewing this individual or if it's just the two of them but it sounds like it was just him and his companion that we're with now that are still together now I wonder if the state of his ears is also from the same event that's caused him this hip injury those are incredibly ragged ears and I'm not sure exactly what could have caused that branches running through the bush could have torn those ears or who knows you can see how he's also resting that back right foot up and if we just wait a moment or two we may see it try and move forward again and then you'll notice it kind of keeps that leg dead straight as he moves and really favors it Well, these two boys are really on the go slow. Well, thanks Marilyn, Gary and George Ann, as well as a lot of other viewers. Yeah, watch his leg, watch his leg. You see how interesting this is. Sorry though, but thank you very much for all of those updates confirming that this is in fact the elephant that you saw with Jamie the other day. Oh, is he going to give us a bit of action here, or is he just smelling that plant? I just saw him hold his trunk back and face us, and wasn't sure if it was us that got him interested, or if it was a tasty tree. And I don't think it's us, I think it's the tasty vegetation around us that he's smelling, and sampling the air with his trunk before 
coming in and breaking off the branches again. Aren't we so lucky to have these elephants coming right up to us, so relaxed. And that's so important to remember. These animals in many parts of Africa are persecuted by humans for their ivory and because of that they certainly don't act or treat humans the same way in those areas. So, very unfortunate and let's take a closer look and enjoy being so close to this African giant. I really love these raggedy ears of his. He's also got perfect, perfect ivory. And it looks like he's gonna come right past us here. Hello, boy. How are you doing? You are so close to us. How cool is this? Can you believe it? Hello, boy. What can you smell? I'm so tempted to put my hand out to you, but I'm not going to. Hey. Hey, boy. That was incredible. I think that's probably one of the most awesome sightings I've ever had of an elephant being close to me. Whew. I mean, his trunk must have been about that far away, just testing the, the wind, and I was wanting to just put my hand out just to like kind of do a little handshake, trunk shake, but it's not advisable to ever push the envelope and try and take things that far and rather just sit and keep still and let the animals decide how far they would like to take it. But that was really special. I hope you all enjoyed that. I certainly did. Jandre has got a big smile on his face. So does Jerry, who's joining us again on this morning safari. Jerry, how's your heart rate? Is it okay? Thumbs up. So Jerry's in one piece. I think that is definitely the closest Jerry's been to an elephant before. What an absolute fortune to be able to experience that. You can see he has changed appearance ever so slightly. But that's all a bit self-explanatory. He also had a little toilet break just after he walked past us. And the wind is blowing perfectly in our direction. And it smells actually quite sweet and refreshing, almost like an African bran muffin, you could say. Unbaked though just the raw materials quite quite a nice smell it's not nearly anything as horrid as lion dung a fresh elephant dropping is actually quite sweet smelling and there's the other bull who looks slightly younger to me although maybe I'm wrong He's also excited about something, not sure what, but at least they are both in sync and maybe they've infrasonically communicated with or heard a breeding herd nearby and that thought's aroused them or hard to say, but clearly they're happy about something. Maybe it's just the wonderful breakfast they're enjoying. I was discussing how important elephants destructive eating behavior is and Gigi in the Prince Edward Islands would like to know if their destruction is permanent and whether it's a good or a bad thing. Now Gigi, there
destructive eating behavior certainly is permanent for the trees that they do pluck out and kill but it requires permanent upkeep and I was just mentioning a few moments ago without elephants in Africa we would have a completely different ecosystem and one that is not suitable for all the animals of Africa so their feeding is necessary in order to create microhabitats to break down every time they push down a tree they're creating a small microbiome and those little biomes are going to be nurseries for small plants to grow in and also safe havens for little animals so even though they do cause a lot of destruction it's a necessary destruction and I guess it's semi-permanent you could say permanent for any plants that they kill there and then but it requires upkeep and just outside this reserve on the other side of the fence there's incredibly thick impenetrable woodland where the local people who like to graze their cattle have a hard time because the vegetation is so thick there's no space for the grass to grow whereas if elephants were still living there it would create an environment similar to this one that buffalo can walk through no different to a cow and feed on the grass that's an example of how without elephants the habitat doesn't become suitable for certain animals especially the feeders of grass from this angle you can see his back right hip sticking out quite clearly it also looks to be a lot lower than it should be as it's dislocated and obviously dropped down just going to get on the radio quickly and update Aubrey he's found Tingana's leopard uh, this male leopard tracks and I just want to update him where I lost them Aubrey, I lost those tracks on Voyatella Access. It looked like they headed west just before Galago shortcuts. Donna and a whole load more of you aren't we so lucky and we certainly did get spoiled with that elephant sighting I'm so glad you guys appreciated it because that doesn't happen often and it could be many moons before that kind of an interaction happens again one or two of you said it was the equivalent of an elephant high five I'd almost take it one step further and it felt like that elephant was hugging us it was incredible the way its little trunk was moving around so close to us. I wonder what was going through its head. That would be nice to know. But I think that would be greedy. I don't think we could want anything more from this morning's safari after such a quality sighting like that. Well, they're moving into some thick bush. I'm not sure what we're going to do next. Hello again to Brian in Philadelphia and very happy to see you sending through as many questions as you are. Brian is one of the viewers who learnt about Safari Live in November last year and after just six months of being introduced to this concept he decided to come out on Safari so we've actually met him and while he was out here I asked him does he ever send through questions and he said no he's never sent through one so we begged and pleaded for him to change and slowly he's sending through more questions and hope all is well in Philadelphia Brian 
Well, I'm interested to know the rips and tears in that elephant's ear. How much of an effect will it have on his ability to thermoregulate? It's a good question, Brian, and for those of you who don't know, elephants have the ability to pump liters and liters of blood through those very large ears, and that's what keeps them cool during the heat of the African day. The large ears that they have aren't to help receive audio signals, they aren't cup-shaped like a satellite, so they're entirely for thermoregulation. And I don't think that those tears are going to have too much of an effect, Brian, because they're on the kind of terminal edges of the ears and most of the veins will be growing or, 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 or spreading through the initial parts of the ear, not the periphery. So I don't think it's going to have a huge effect, but it will certainly have an effect to a degree. He's lost a little bit of the surface area and surface area helps drastically with cooling. And to give you an idea of how much surface area those ears make up, it's 20% of the elephant's body or surface area is made up by the ears, which is a fact that's hard to believe, but I guess what we need to remember is that they're double-sided and very large. So Jamie's been out searching for any sign of the Salala Pride and I'm sure a lot of you will be interested to know on how she's getting along as well as if there has been any sign of those lions yet. We're going to keep slowly moving through this area. Sadly the elephants did move off into some impenetrably thick vegetation and let's go and see what else we can find. But over to Jamie and we will keep snooping around this area and hopefully find something for you shortly. Sounds like Scott had the most amazing elephant encounter. What a special moment to spend with quite a character that we've got to know over the last two days. I have been looking for the Salada Pride. I headed up to Bifflehook. It looks as though they disappeared into that corner around Sydney's Dam and up into Bifflehook. I did catch one or two tracks coming through and I think that's where they've headed off. So I've returned, I've just heard an update from Aubrey right now on the radio to say that he heard Impala alarm calling right close to Inga's house, so close to quarantine. Done a big loop and I'm heading back there now to see if we can figure out what's been shouting. Ah, and here comes Aubrey himself. Why those Impala were? Yeah, no, sir. But I hope that he was a leopard. Coming yeah, through the fence, coming from the uh, stuff with us. Yeah. And the machine gun was calling in the drainage line as well. Where are you coming from? Sir? From the side. Yeah, no sign of the tracks there. Okay. But I'll check. I'll go around the side. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, guys. coordinating our search efforts. Now, I know that Scott has been tracking this mail, we've started tracking this mail this morning. Could be him, could also be another leopard, it could well be Karula returning to Juma. She was on Torchwood last night. Let's check very carefully in this drainage line. Nyala in high spirits. Now those are in particular very good alarm systems. Nyala are very, very alert to the presence of anything. A couple of young males and one female. Hmm, not only are the Impala alarm calling, but it sounds as though Zola and Kara are alarm calling as well. I can hear dogs barking. 
and I think it might be time to just head across. I think at the moment, because the den, the hyena den, is so close to the lodge, I think that's quite often what's setting them off. Nyala look perfectly relaxed as they move through. Hello, boy. Very peaceful sounding morning. I'm just sitting quietly for the moment to listen for any other alarm calls. I think our Nyala is going to disappear into this drainage line and I want to just do a quick loop around Inga's house see if we can find any sign of what the Impala was shouting at As I said, the Salalas have headed across it looks like they've headed across into Bukhosuk I can't find their tracks from where they would have been. Alright, bear with me a moment. Nope. Just my imagination playing tricks on me in terms of tracks. Sometimes you get impala tracks on top of each other that end up looking like toes. then transforms, especially when you're looking for a leopard, immediately transforms itself into a paw in your brain. about the Salalas, there's lots and lots of viewers out there, including Chris, Amy, Lynn, Diane, Natasha, who are all wondering if I have an update on that young male from the Salala Pride. I, I don't. I, as far as I know, he's still missing, and the fact that he's been missing for three days now, I have to be honest, and I don't want to think this, I want to think best case scenario. I would say there's maybe a 10% chance at the most that he's still alive somewhere, wandering around Arethusa trying to relocate his pride. I, I just think he got really unlucky, particularly because he was injured, he was limping, and the Birmingham boys are still on their testosterone high, it was probably them, unlikely to have been any other males. They're still on their testosterone high, they know that they're not going to have an opportunity to mate with those females just yet and they probably went after him. There were tracks all over Arethusa that morning. Um, I'm sh not sure if you were watching or not, but it was about three days ago where the Birmingham boys, we could hear them calling and then they somehow managed to duck and escape us and head around to, head around to Torchwood to the south of our boundary, but they were calling in a way that's very common to see in male lions after they've had a fight with something. And I honestly think they caught up with the Salalas on Arethusa and that young male could not get away. I'm hoping I'm wrong that it's lost somewhere for now. But either way, the situation doesn't look good for that young male. Completely, I completely share Angie in Ohio's views. Angie, I agree up in this whole takeover issue. They ran from the, the Matimbas caused them trouble, so they ran away from the Matimbas straight into the waiting clutches of the Birmingham boys. They've just been so, so unlucky. And those males are at exactly the wrong age for this entire process to have played out. They're young, they're still far from independence, but they're, they are males. And it's just put them so much higher up on the risk scale. 
and unfortunately with that comes the risk posed to the females as well because if they fight to protect them as we think happened with that Inkaruma lioness then there's a chance that it's going to end badly for them and I think it already has but we'll keep fingers crossed because lions are consummate survivors and that female that's leading them the, the female without the tail she is incredibly experienced she knows what she's doing she's not a young lioness and this is probably not the first pride takeover she's lived through hopefully she'll be able to keep the rest of them safe and it does pretty much all rest on her shoulders um, been doing some landscaping um, and I know that Scott is trying to get hold of me at the moment but there's a conversation happening just right now Aubrey and <coughs> squeezing through now just excuse Ted for one moment he might have to in a moment wipe the screen we're connecting actually that spider web is attached to me too As we drive through, they've all made their webs across the road during the night where they bundle up their silk and their, what are they called? Their feet, but I'm not, I'm not looking for feet, I'm looking for another word. Anyway, they bundle the, the silk up in their feet and then they throw it into the air, it catches in the wind and blows across and attaches to an anchor point. And then we come around the next morning and drive through it and collect them. I used to collect quite a few spider webs you always do when you're walking, especially in midsummer, which is why you should always walk with somebody taller in front of you. They collect them for you. That's that's been my system. Uh, Scott Scott. Sorry, just getting hold of Scott. Just planning our, our routes for the morning so that we divide the labor properly. I want to go and check Ingwe Alley. So I was saying that behind somebody who's talking to you, the spider webs for you. That being said, I don't really have a problem with spider webs. My little brother, on the other hand, not his favorite thing, let's put it that way. There have been some squeals in the past in relation to spider webs attaching themselves to him. And I know I've told this story before, but one of my favorite spider encounter moments was with a group that I was staying in and drive with. And we were in one of the three vehicle safari vehicles that you often find three row seats. Yes, levitate from the front row to the back row without touching the middle row in absolute terror. I've never seen somebody run sitting down before, but she ran sitting down. It was incredible. Her legs and arms were moving frantically. And that, of course, was in response to a golden orb web spider. It's a big, it's a really big spider. It can be up to that big black and white and red and really scary looking completely pretty much complete harmless. they might give you a nip if you irritate them but they for the most part are incredibly flaccid they've got no venom even if they look incredibly dangerous uh, unfortunately my signal's breaking up let's head across to Scott for now I'll be back with you in the future, hopefully with our leopard in tow. So, sadly, Jamie's signal is not treating her very well this morning. So, hopefully that improves. 
We have literally just come on to Arethusa and I'm about to get an update on the radio as to what's going on here. So give me a second or two please. Morning Ryan, any updates? I'm just crossing in a dead dam road. Go ahead. Okay, copy. Thanks very much. Confirm is it in Kwanzaa for the Birmingham's or Sonata? Copy. Thanks. No updates from our side, but the Birmingham's well are sitting northwest towards kind of one hour town. Okay, so apologies for that everyone, I actually forgot that you were with me for a moment. Just processing the information there from Sean and Ryan. And they have found tracks of the Matimba males crossing into Sibambili, which is a property where we cannot go between Arethusa and the northern fence line. It's a little thin property. So... That's not looking promising to see them, but that's not a problem at all because there's lots of other animals out here. And we'll maybe just do a little loop through Arethusa and see if we can't find any sign of maybe shadow. Or anything else of interest as the morning progresses. Interestingly, the beautiful cloud cover that we enjoyed this morning has dissipated to absolutely nothing. And <coughs> Derek is just asking if we have any local myths on the cloud formations and the effect that they may have on your day in Derek's home. The saying goes, red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. So that's interesting, but I don't personally know of any local cloud myths. That's not to say that there aren't some, and there probably are. But I am none the wiser in that regard. So thanks for sharing the local myth from your area, Derek. topic of clouds, Kathy in Florida would like to know what will the animals do, especially the lions, when it's rainy? And will they seek shelter? Or will they just kind of lie out in the open? And I guess it depends on how strong the rain is. But typically even under a bush you're not going to escape the water entirely and it's always going to you're always going to get wet out here it's going to be beautiful there's a herd of Inyala just getting ready or they possibly have already finished taking a drink in this drying little water hole 
all different shapes and sizes, a big male, adult females with the youngsters from this time last year, one young male and one young female. Beautiful. What's interesting is you can distinguish between Oh, it's actually two young males. You can distinguish between males and females. The males will have the white chevron between the eyes. So even the young males who are the same caramel brown color as their mothers, the mothers will lack that white chevron between the eyes and the males will have them. Oh, I've just heard a Deirdre's cuckoo. <whistles> and I know a lot of you are hoping to add that to your birds list. So, we're about to go on a cuckoo hunt. Just want to stop for a second and try and work out where exactly it is calling from. And I know Khada was missing the Deirdre's cuckoo from her list, so I hope you're watching Khada because we could well find this bird if it continues to call. What a beautiful scene this is, and Jandre is doing a great job on camera. There's the cuckoo again. And again. <laughs> Just a, a question through from Mary in Pennsylvania, and she's wondering what is the bird that makes a call similar to bed spring squeaking and it's a frequently heard call Mary it will be Franklin that make that call so I'm not sure exactly which one but it's the Franklin possibly then it's old Franklin or the crested Franklin they all have a fairly similar kind of call which is quite similar to that of Rusty bread springs squeaking. And I'm sure if you just double check the cause of the either the crested Franklin or the Natal Franklin or the red crested uh, spur file, or sorry, the Swainson spur file, I just made up its own name there. Um, the Swainson spur file, you will be able to double check that. Great. Well, just a few days ago we were viewing the Salala Pride at the same waterhole where the Inyala were. You now something very different. Now, there's a tree up ahead of us where a few days ago we saw two African scops owl. I'm trying to work out if it is their home on a daily basis or if it's somewhere in this area. I'm fairly convinced it's somewhere in this area because just a couple of days ago I came back to double check here and we did see an African scop sail fly out of a tree nearby. So their home could be a summer and it would be incredible if we found out exactly where they were nesting. Let's take a closer look here. Maybe we'll get lucky. I think we're in luck. We are. It's not going to be a great view, but let's just see what happens here. Sitting up there. Oh, just going to stop here. 
it's sitting so close to us in the tree we aren't going to be able to see its head from here though look you can see it's incredibly well camouflaged feathers blowing in the wind so this tree they love to sit in almost on a daily basis as far as we're aware and there could be a cavity in a tree nearby where the other owl, its partner, is busy incubating eggs. Now I would love to get you a view of its eyes, so, but I also don't want to chase it away from its perch here. They're typically nocturnal, so by flushing it in the daylight hours we may make its presence known to all the other little birds in this area who may pester it throughout the day whereas here where it is camouflaged it's getting a peaceful morning without being harassed so I'm inclined to actually not try and get into a different position if we zoom out and just have a look around you we don't have many places to go it's a thick area with a riverbed down to our right and lots of thick vegetation down to our left so we're just going to rather slowly get this owl used to us and hopefully next time we arrive here it's going to be relaxed with us and have its head out in the open but by us scaring it we're going to rush you over to Jamie's vehicle she's having some fun over there so See you later. <laughs> oh, you're so cross. Oh, you naughty. Yes, you naughty. Hello, the poor one. That was absolutely adorable. Listen, mister. Okay, all right. Okay, mom. I'm not doing anything. Your baby started it. Your baby started it. It wasn't me, I promise. It was... That was such a perfect example of discipline. Sorry, I can't move the car at the moment. That was incredible. That was not mommy coming to say, stop playing with my baby. That was mommy coming up to baby to say, stop taunting the car. We had dust flying. That baby came within probably 50 centimeters of the car. All right, guys. Here we go. Calm down. Wow. Little one, you naughty. That can only be a male. Yeah, it's a male car. And then older sibling as well. Perfect example of an all helper. So lots of help coming from different oh baby's coming back sorry Ted let's just see if this baby's going to do the same thing I know it's straight into the sun little one it's really okay I know you want to play but I'm maybe not the toy to play with <laughs> about two years old and discovering how to be cheeky I think that probably the most enthusiastic charge I've ever had from an elephant that age and look how protective this older sibling is being that's not the mother but coming to stand between us and the threat or between the baby and the threat sure interesting behavior they really are they are phenomenally complex animals the older sibling is coming through now on your screen. She's a female and she's practicing her mothering skills. She's probably the older sister, but it could be that she's an older cousin. And she's practicing being a mom and looking after babies. This is a huge herd. We're surrounded by probably about 20 to 30 elephants. Epic feeling. And just about two seconds ago, before I, before Ted spotted them, if I'm honest, I stopped to pick up a piece of magic guari bush in the hope that it would both fight off gremlins and bring us beautiful sightings. And it's serving to do the job very, very well. 
<laughs> I'm so impressed with that baby's courage. That was very impressive. Quite the little showman. Dust flying, I've got dust up my nose, I've got dust in my eyes. And the cows are feeding very peacefully. <laughs> Sandra <laughs> is saying that I must have had siblings because I was blaming the baby. Yep, I did. I had a younger brother. I know all about what those taunting moments are like when they're young. Very familiar. And with an eight years age difference, you can just imagine. We're very close now, but we certainly had our moments. There is a tiny, tiny, tiny little weenie one at the back. I'm hoping it's going to come out into the open if we sit tight. But yes, I definitely had a younger sibling. Oh, there's nothing better than a cheeky baby. Hello, guys. There's a nice big male who's moving through as well. Oh. And some young boys having a bit of a sparring and a playful session in front of us. We've had a lot of babies coming through. You've seen lots and lots of new elephant babies, or very, very young ones anyway. And Charlotte, who's watching us from Port Elizabeth in South Africa, Charlotte wants to know if they mate and give birth at a specific time of year. And the answer is no, they don't really. Although there is a bit of a peak in terms of giving birth in the rainy season. All right, I'm trying to have eyes in the corner of my head here and keep an eye on all the ellies around me. But Charlotte, as far as I know, there's a slight peak for the rainy season, which might be why we're seeing a couple of young calves now, which means that they, there will be a peak in mating two years prior to that, around the rainy season at the same time, because they gestate for essentially two years. And now, why are you shaking your head at me? Also, a boy, I mean, to cause trouble. I'm just sitting here, dude. I'm not doing anything. You're going to get me into trouble, you lot. Yeah. You're going to come and cause trouble and then your mom's going to come and investigate. <laughs> you can see that backwards and forwards rocking. Trunk twisting kind of aimlessly. And that's telling us that this little boy doesn't really know what to do. He's thinking about coming to run towards us, but he's got a little bit more fear than that calf did. Come on, dude. The baby was braver than you are. It's all right, boy. Ah, I'm going to spar with brother instead, or cousin, probably. Two very similar-sized boys. Well, I think the one on the right is a little bit stronger. Oh, here comes our little Bubba. Sure, that's close. Hello, little one. Oh, you're so furry. Okay. <laughs> Racing across the road. I'm pretty sure we've seen that little boy before. Right next to mom. Look how easily it fits under mom's stomach. That's still a very young calf. We are absolutely surrounded by them with a perfect view of the little baby in front. With the pale spots still around the ears and the face. Oh, bye. Oh, sorry, it's a little girl. Bye bye, girl. I love spending time with elephants. They really are just the best. 
there's nothing like the feeling and they're all very relaxed I mean apart from the baby boy who was coming to cause trouble which they do do they're all incredibly relaxed if this one come through in front of me and oh we do know this herd I thought we did here's our backwards tusk facing friend backwards facing tusk friend I'm not quite sure which one it is here she's coming up to our right she's going to come in front of us we know this herd so we do know that little baby we've seen it sleeping before there she is oh that tusk is phenomenal Now, I was chuckling a little bit at the babies shaking their heads, and that's because I'm very much familiar with elephant behavior, and I know how to read what's happening within a herd. Now, that situation could have gone slightly differently. I was watching mom the whole time really carefully out of the corner of my eye as the baby was playing in front of us. And she knew we were there. She was watching what her baby was doing, and she was very relaxed about it. So when she came forward and did her rumble in response to her baby's provocation, I knew that she was disciplining him and not us. That being said, it's very important to remember, especially if you're coming to visit Kruger and you're driving yourself, it's important to remember that there are warning signs from elephants. Now, Sean and Secunda, you were wanting to know what signs or wanting me to share what signs I would look for if an elephant was committed to a charge. They're all walking straight into the sun, but I will get us a nice visual again in a moment. So if an elephant is committed to charging a vehicle, um, there's a couple of things to look for. First of all, most of the time it's come from provocation itself, so people being too much in their space, keeping their car engines on, possibly revving. There's been a lot of bad behavior, not bad behavior, ignorant behavior within the Kruger National Park that's led to the elephants there being provoked. Hey, mister, Oi. you behave. The reason I'm raising my voice to him is because he's a bull and he's being naughty. That tail up, you see how he walked across the road with his head up, his tail up? And I've got my hat up because sometimes that's quite a useful device in terms of just distracting them. But he's moved on, nothing too serious, but again, bulls you respond to differently. Cows are showing aggression because they are protective of their herds. Bulls often show that kind of What's the word? Aggression is maybe too strong a word. Spirit? It's maybe a little bit cliched, but they show that, that uppertiness when they come towards you because they're trying to push their weight around. So you respond differently to cows and to bulls. Bulls you need to meet with slightly more firmness. The cows need to be, up until right at the last minute, need to be met with a calm approach so that you don't make yourself any more of a threat than you already are. But to get to Sean's, back to Sean's question, because this is important, especially if any of you guys are planning on visiting Kruger. An elephant committing to a charge, a lot of the time they are going to give you warning signs first. That head shake, the tails up in the air, sometimes they're very vocal about it, moving a couple of steps towards you and then dropping their head and swinging their trunks so that it makes a slapping sound with their ears. Those are signs that they are not comfortable with you. If you're really close, you want to sit nice and still, and as soon as they back off, I think we, my signal's playing up a little bit, so Sorry to rush you away from what sounded like a wonderful elephant sighting with Jamie, but not to worry because you're about to have one with us. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle ever so slightly. I want to do it quite hastily because this whole herd of elephants is going to pass in front of us, which will be quite beautiful. There we go. This should work well. 
They're all coming up to investigate us. They're everywhere, all around us. Holding their trunks up into the air. Beautiful. The youngsters really putting on a show. As I'm told, you also got spoiled with some great sightings with Jamie. And a big cow. Well, certainly seem to be lots of elephants about this morning. And they're not territorial, so always wonderful when they are numerous in numbers on Juma and Arethusa because they make for such wonderful viewing and even when they aren't in the most entertaining of moods they are still generally always doing something which makes for great viewing so just to update you on some other important animals that have been found just north of Arethusa on Sibambili it's the Birmingham males five male lions that have been found. Sadly though we are not permitted to go there but at least we know where they are and maybe they will pop onto Arethusa a little bit later on this morning and that way we would be able to see them this afternoon hopefully. And other than that there's not too much going on. They're not too sure where Shadow is, a female leopard who was viewed yesterday afternoon. But we are in that general area now and that's why I've come here in the hope that we can find her. I haven't seen a leopard for approaching three weeks now and I'm beginning to get desperate cravings to change that. I may have given the wrong information here. I don't know if I've been saying the Matimba males or the Birmingham males, but it's the Birmingham males that are on Sibambili, not the Matimba males. And the Matimba males are far south. They haven't been seen anywhere near Juma for probably close on a month now since the Birmingham boys arrived. And that was one question that came through and I know Arlene and a few others were also interested to know on their current position now so Joyce like I said that was your question regarding the Matimba males they are still far south on a property called Londolozi and they just apparently set up shop there and don't appear to be having any trouble from other males that used to patrol that area and have showed no signs of coming back further north towards Juma to their old territory which is now occupied by the Birmingham males. So a lot is going on here regarding lions and their territories, a lot of which we don't exactly know what has happened or what is happening or can't account for certain prides. But we are doing our best to keep our finger on the pulse. Hoping we're going to find some tracks of shadow. Sadly, none of the guides who have already been driving around here have provided us with that information or had any luck finding tracks. So she could be snoozing in one of the thick blocks between the roads. sent through a comment saying it's up to the, the leopards especially Shadow and Karula to determine when they will be seen they are tricky customers and can often be oh, be uh, can be quite difficult to see there's two African green pigeons here the one at the back looks to or the top looks to be a male and he is attempting to try and seduce this female which is below him. 
They're beautiful, beautiful pigeons that are brightly green in color and have a red and yellow bill as well as a bright turquoise blue eye. And they were hopping from branch to branch, the male on the top evidently chasing the female, but they seem to have calmed down as we got the camera on them. There we go, there's a beautiful view. Look at that! Bright yellow feathers and legs. What an awesome bird. And Afrikaans or Dutch, one of the local South African languages, it's called a papachaidef, which means a parrot dove, which I think is a wonderful description for the bird. Now the only reason that I know that this is the male on the top is because of his behavior. The male and females look exactly the same. There's no features that you can look at and distinguish them. It's just that he was hopping around wildly after her. So some of the birds out here have got a drastic difference in plumage and coloration between male and female, but the African green pigeons look identical. I'm sure a lot of you will be aware of feral pigeons which occur across the globe and how the males will inflate a throat pouch and then let out a call. This pigeon is no different, just a slight variation. And it's the males that will inflate their throat pouch, and he was trying to do the same thing, only that this female was not interested in his advances. I'm hoping if we're just a little bit patient, we will get to see a bit more of this pigeon flirting. And we don't often get to see these pigeons out in the open, especially not in the summer months. In winter, when it's very cold in the morning, they're prone to sunning themselves on open dead trees like this. But in the summer months, we very seldomly see them. They are quite secretive pigeons and actually feed on fruits. So often in the canopies are very thick fruit trees. Just gonna creep forward a couple of meters and see if we can't get a slightly better view of both of them. This should be a lot better. Not quite there. <laughs> so not better at all for now. Just trying to turn the vehicle so Jean-Dre can get a good angle. That's better. Beautiful. There they both are and you can see that they look very, very similar to one another. What's interesting is that they flew into this dead tree and were hopping around wildly just for about five seconds and now have calmed down and are at ease with one another. But maybe they've already been doing a lot of mating and courtship this morning and now need a break. Now from mating to egg laying is often quite short in a terms of period of time with the birds so they could be mating now and be laying the eggs within just a couple of weeks and then incubation is often also short usually around three weeks depending on the bird so within about just over a month they could have little hatchlings and again this is just a very broad generalization for birds of this size and 
just to give you an idea of what goes on before the chicks hatch and then depending on the, the bird species some little hatchlings will be able to kind of fend for themselves just need parental guidance and other birds like the young chicks of these African green pigeons will need very special care and attention they cannot feed themselves they cannot fly they will be nest bound for probably around three to four weeks before they fledge and like most doves and pigeons I'm sure it's not going to be a masterpiece their nest quite a haphazardly constructed platform of twigs I saw a Cape turtle dove's nest the other day when we were out tracking with Steph and there was barely enough twigs to hold up the eggs in the nest you could see quite clearly oh beautiful you could see quite clearly from underneath the nest the eggs lying within it and that understandably indicates to you that it is not a very thick platform of twigs and if I was to give you a rough idea I mean you could really see quite clearly through the base of the nest if it was lying flat like that or bowl shaped rather you could really see such huge gaps between it whereas other birds like the fly catchers and the sunbirds are and the weavers are incredible nest builders and hopefully we'll be able to track down some of their nests for you I wish I had the call of the African green pigeon to play you because Valerie has just asked if they sound like regular pigeons and no they don't it was merely their kind of mating techniques that are similar to the feral pigeon but they've got one of the most wonderful calls in Africa the African green pigeon and I will try and do my imitation of it for you which is not going to be anything like the real deal but possibly humorous if nothing else and it goes kwee, kwee, kuruk, 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 kuruk. something like that but it may be worth just searching for African Green Pigeon audio on the internet machine and see what you come up but it goes something like yeah that's how it finishes the finishes finishes the best in terms of my impersonation my start is a bit weak so it probably doesn't resemble too much of the real thing but that's just the regular contact call i guess it's not necessarily their mating call that they'll mate make to try and seduce another pigeon like the regular feral pigeons when they're doing that with their big throats puffed out We're going to continue searching for any tracks or signs of shadow and in the meantime we will send you, well just in a few seconds actually, let's just enjoy the sights and we've just stumbled upon a water buck. Oh, it doesn't seem to be wanting to hang around. There he is, kind of looking at us but not easy to see. Let me see if I can't roll forward a few meters and get you into a bit of a gap. This should work. Beautiful big waterback bull. Little boy, I love it when they do that with their noses. Quite characteristic of the waterback. They've got the ability to really flex their nostrils.
can also hear a tree squirrel alarm calling in the distance. I wonder if it can if it can see. They've got distinctively heart-shaped nostrils, the waterbuck. Which you would have seen jumping up and down. You also notice how it's swiveling its ears in all directions, making sure that one ear is facing forward, the other ear is facing back, so that they can listen to the sounds all around them. Especially in a kind of windy day like this and thick vegetation, it's going to be a little bit nerve wracking for this waterbuck. There go the nostrils again. No, it's just started chewing the cud. So he's multitasking. He thought, well, why I wait here and watch these humans? I may as well make the most of my time and chew the cud as well. So it's just re-chewing some vegetable matter that he's already chewed on and solid, possibly for the third or fourth time. And what that means is if you were to find some waterbuck dung or droppings and you were to break it up between your fingers it would be a very fine powder whereas the dung of the animals who do not ruminate and who do not process or chew their food very well will be less refined Okay, Mr. Waterbuck, we're going to continue, but before we do, we'll send all of you guys across to Jamie. As I said, I'm going to be looking for leopard tracks, and she's got some interesting tracks that she would like to show you of another carnivore that we don't see as often as we would like to. Well, unfortunately, we had to leave our elephant herd because they're heading into some really thick bush. But keep an eye on the dam cam because they might be heading in that direction very shortly. I have a question for you guys. I want to see if you can figure out what track this is. So we're looking at this track here. It's a little bit tricky. It's one of the more difficult ones. So I'm going to give you a few hints. First of all, it might be a bit difficult to see, so I'm going to give you the outline. This is the outline of the back pad, and it has two lobes, and it's almost triangular in appearance. It's got two lobes in the sole, and then, most importantly, probably one of the biggest giveaways, the front toes are here, and there's something else that's made an impression in the sand, maybe about a centimeter away from the front of the front toes. There's something that's touched here, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. I want to see if you guys can guess and tell me what you think it is. I've seen one on this road before, only once. I'm hoping to see one again. It's come down all the way down this road. And the animal responsible for this track walks regular pathways up and down. The foot is about this big, that's the size, that's the length of the foot, so about the length of my finger. What do you guys think that it is? You can send that answer through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv, and I'm not going to give you any further hints, because otherwise I'm going to give it away. There's two animals that it could possibly be, walking up and down with that shape track, and they're really similar. And once you've got it right, when you get it right, because I have a lot of faith in our viewers, when you get it right, then we can talk a little bit more and I can show you some pictures that I have of the two different species. I've returned back to where Scott had the last leopard tracks and where those alarm calls were coming from. I'm hoping that he might be tucked away somewhere here. Bear with me because as with all earpieces, I'm sure you've experienced this with your own headphones, no matter how gently you put them down, how organized they are when you take them out of your ears, by the time you get back to them, even if it is the space of five minutes, they've tied themselves in knots. All right, I'm curious to hear if 
you can figure out which track that is. I'm actually very glad that those tracks survived because I saw them earlier and there's been a bit of traffic on this road so we got lucky. It was one or two surviving tracks for us to show you. In an attack of the gremlins, we were chatting about elephant behavior and Sean had asked what signs elephant gives, what are signs an elephant will give when they're serious about a charge. And Dave, who's watching from Texas, you were saying if they get too frisky and voice commands don't work, do you sound your horn at them? And the answer is no. That's a sound that is likely to provoke a serious charge. It's a difficult one because you'll see us doing things that I probably wouldn't recommend that you imitate when you're in Kruger. So talking sternly to an elephant, maybe if you can't get out of the situation as a last resort, that's the way to go. But for the most part, I would say if elephants are showing those signs of friskiness or aggression, then it's time for you to leave whenever safely possible, rather than shouting at them or try to deter them. Um, we sometimes, what I sometimes do is I tap the car when, I, when my voice commands aren't working. It's not something I've had to do while I've been working at Juma. I have had to do it in the past. And I either try and tap the side of the car gently, and it needs to be gentle because the hearing is very, very good. Or I find something that makes a slightly metallic noise. So if I've got a piece of metal on me, then I use that to tap the side of the door. It's just a noise that breaks them out of that moment. But you must always be prepared for the fact that animals are unpredictable. And if that elephant goes quiet and starts running towards you with its ears shut and its trunk rolled up, it, might, it is time to leave, and it's time to leave fast. I've only ever, because I, I've worked in reserves where it is good ethics to teach elephants good manners, so you don't teach them that by coming up and giving people an, a fright in the car, that car's going to run away. Then it becomes a game. So I, I generally avoid driving away from elephants unless absolutely necessary. The only time I've ever, ever raced away from an elephant was at night. I pulled off the road. I turned off my lights because there was another car full of guests coming. And I just heard it. I didn't hear a thing. It didn't scream at me. I couldn't see it. I just heard running footsteps off to my left. And because of the situation, I just put my foot down, lifted the clutch and sped off up the hill. And the elephant shot out right where the car had been. Then it turned and screamed at me. And then it ran away. But even then, I drove away a little bit and stopped, just so I was out of the elephant's face. But we're also, we're reading elephant behavior and we're responding in a way that I don't necessarily, or I wouldn't necessarily advise for people driving their rental cars within Kruger. And it's very much a matter of circumstance as well. It seems as though Scott has had some wonderful bird action on Arethusa and it's continuing now. Let's head across to him. I will be back with you in a moment. So we've got a really interesting sighting happening here. This is a Levalian's cuckoo. It's the same cuckoo we saw yesterday. And the birds that are chasing it there now are Aramark babblers. Watch it closely. It's being... It's hard for Jandre. He's going to have to swing the camera around a bit from side to side in order to get the shots. But what's happening there is that the Levalian's cuckoo, who we saw yesterday and spoke about yesterday, the only bird that it will parasitize is the Aramark babbler, which are the birds that are now currently chasing it. So they obviously know that it's trying to lay its egg in their nest and then allow them to raise their, its chick, which is of course not what they want. So this is a battle going on here. 
I really wonder where the Aramark Babbler's nest is. If we stick around here long enough, we may actually <coughs> be able to see it. But let's just be patient and see if we can't get to see the Babblers chasing the cuckoo one or two more times. So I think you're getting some good views, also some good audio coming through. Let's try to creep a little bit closer. Because they're so caught up with one another's agendas that I think we may be able to get a bit closer in without them being too bothered by our presence. And who knows, maybe we'll even get to see the nest of the Aramark babblers. in front of us. An incredible view. There goes the babbler chasing it. Boom! This is awesome. I've never seen interaction like this between cuckoos and babblers. And you may find what's happening is that not one but two cuckoos are trying to distract. Yeah, that's what's happening. Chandra, have you got them? No, it's a wood Lower down here, yeah, or to stay on the cuckoos, please, at one o'clock. Yeah. There we go, right in there. So there's the Aramark babbler, that's... And then bottom left of your screen, just straight in, Chandra, if you zoom straight in, there's, there's the cuckoo, and it's kind of acting distressed shaking its wing feathers, trying to create a distraction. I'm sure that's what it's doing. By coming down onto the ground and shaking its wing feathers like that, it's almost creating a target for some of the babblers to rush in towards. And while those babblers are there, I'm sure the other cuckoo will be trying to get to their nest, which they will already know its position. But now getting their egg in there is the next problem. Let's creep forward a little bit more. Now something that <coughs> has just come through is a good question from Chris. And it's all happening. Um, Chris is wondering whether the babblers will be able to throw the egg of the cuckoo out of the nest. And the cuckoos are very clever. The eggs will look so similar to that of the babblers that once the egg is in the ground, I'm just going to creep forward ever so oh no, here they come again. What they'll do is, oh, right towards us, right in front of our vehicle. This is crazy. So much going on, and John is doing a great job, guys. It's incredibly difficult to film a scenario like this live and not be able to cut and paste it together afterwards without you guys getting seasick, but we're going for it. Because this is high intensity. Cuckoo's just landed straight in front of us again. I wonder where their nest is. It must be... Isn't this awesome? Hard to tell exactly what's going on, but you can tell that the cuckoos are really insistent in being in this area and the babblers are doing their best to chase them away. And the babblers are cooperative breeders. They live in families of about five to six birds with a dominant pair of adults. It's just going bananas here. And it's the cuckoos who are making the most noise. I've just seen some feathers being plucked out of one. The babblers aren't taking any chances here. Oh, there's their nest. There's their nest. I've just seen their nest. Incredible. Well done, Jandre. That's their nest up, up on the fork of this acacia tree. It's hard to see it there. I'm fairly certain that in that fork is where the nest is, and that's where
Maybe not though. They don't nest in cavities of trees. They make a very big, loose nest with twigs. But there seem to be a lot of kind of jostling around that spot there. Can you believe the ongoings here? Literally the Aramark babblers you're looking at now pulled some feathers out of the Levalian's cuckoo and they were just seen drifting off into the wind. So this is a very serious affair here and the babblers are doing their best to try and keep their nest safe. And I'm guessing the nest is somewhere in this dead knobthorn tree to our right, but on second looks but it could be just on the other side there it's hard to see a nest from this side and I've actually never seen the nest of Aramark Fabulous before I just know that it's a loosely constructed bed of twigs I cannot believe we were speaking about this happening just yesterday and we were already getting to see this remarkable interaction. Now what's interesting is that certain cuckoos will be less fussy with regards to who their foster parents will be, but the Levalian's cuckoo, which is the ones we've been viewing now, will only target the arrow-marked babbler. It is the only bird that will be able to raise their young. So some of the other cuckoos will be able to use starlings as a broader species or weavers and not have to use a specific individual like this. Well, that was some serious high intensity viewing. And sorry if you got a little bit seasick along the way, but like I say, this is a live safari and we'll do whatever it takes to get you the shots. And I think Jandre did an incredible job swinging that camera around as smoothly as he did because he was making it look far easier than it actually is to film something like that in this thick vegetation. But for now, it looks like the babblers have won. And no further sign of the cuckoos. They may need to go elsewhere in search of a babbler nest. I wonder how long it takes them to actually be able to find a potential host for their young. That in itself must be a challenge, and then getting your egg into that nest is the cuckoo's next challenge, which clearly is not an easy one if anything standards are to, if this morning standards are anything to go by. Those babblers were not taking any chances and doing a great job in keeping the cuckoos at bay. One moment you're hoping to find leopard tracks, the next moment you are thoroughly enjoying such an interesting sighting. Like I said, in all my years in the bush I've never seen such quality interactions between cuckoos and the birds that they parasitize. And at one stage, like I said, sadly you didn't get to see it, but one of the babblers came in and literally plucked feathers out of a cuckoo that were just left wafting off in the air. Well done, babblers. Good job.
cuckoos. I didn't forget about the Deirdrix cuckoo, which we had earlier on on the safari up at Red Dam. We sent you back to Jamie shortly after we were leaving that area, but hung around for a while hoping to hear its calls to get us a little bit closer by, but it had gone silent. So, we're just going to have to wait until it calls again and hopefully we'll be closer by and be able to pinpoint its location. good headway in Jamie's tracking quiz that she's performed for you guys and she wants to get you back onto those tracks and finish up the quiz so good luck and we will catch up a little bit later It seems as though I have caught the majority majority of you out. Now, if we didn't have people who got it correct, I might have thought that I'd made it a bit too difficult. Maybe it wasn't clear. But we do have three very clear winners. The Triple L, Lisa Lynn, and... Oh, hold on. Lisa Lynn. One more. Give me a moment. And Lily. Lisa, Lily and Lynn, the three of you got it right. <laughs> Thanks, Dora. <laughs> I had a momentary brain freeze. You guys got it right. You said it was a honey badger. That was a difficult one. It really was. It was tricky. I know the majority of you said it was cheetah. It is not cheetah. You also suggested jackal would have been a bit smaller. Serval and there were also a couple of other guesses around civet and so on. But you were correct, Lisa, Lily and Lynn. And I'm going to show you why because it was a difficult one. So bear with me a moment as we stop here on Impala Plains with our herd of Impala to watch our tracking lesson. I did keep my places in my book. I expected more answers to include porcupine because that is the one that, keeping my place for the quarry bush, that is the one that would have been the most easy to confuse it with. This is a porcupine track and it's most identifiable from the honey badger because it's got multiple lobes in the back pad. So remember I was chatting to you a little bit about how it only has two lobes. That is what I was expecting most of you to confuse it with. And in terms of the honey badger, this, these tracks that I'm showing you now are exact size, although in this case it was, slight, it was a slightly smaller individual, but these tracks are the right size. This is the honey badger track. This is the track that I was showing you. Look, it was in soft sand, but there's the two lobes that we could see with the toes. And then most importantly with the distance, that was another hint I was giving you. The distance from the toe to the claw is just over a centimeter. A very big track, um, or a very big distance between the tracks of the claws and the toes. Because honey badgers have such enormously long claws, powerful digging claws. Now we've been looking at dung beetles, and just while I have this picture in front of me, if we have a look down here, I've spoken about how the dung beetle digs down and buries the ball of dung and lays its larva in there. This is what it looks like when a honey badger digs it up. It's got a cavity in the middle where the honey badger's broken it open with a combination of claws and teeth and dug in to pull the larva out. And it's something we're always on the lookout and I'm sure at some point we will find in the summer months, we'll find where the honey badgers have been digging it out. Now one more thing I want to show you, one of the other tracks that it was confused with, almost the right size, although a cheetah is slightly bigger, but most importantly what I would have pointed out to you would be the three lobes at the back. Cheetah have very distinctive three lobes, just like all of our big cats that we go out and track, and they make for quite a sharp corner, but they are very clear. So yes, although the cheetah does have claws, 
It doesn't have that asymmetrical triangular shaped lobe. It's more of an oblong shape, a sort of more egg shaped track. And there you can see the lobes. And if we look down just a little bit at this picture here, you can see the sharp track, the sharp corners in the sand of the back lobe, as well as the more widely spaced toes. And ever so slightly bigger. I can also promise you that if it had been a cheetah in the sand there, we would have been frantically driving in that direction. And the chances of tracking a honey badger, however, are a little bit more tricky. Okay, well, that concludes our tracking lesson for the day, but a very well done, very big well done, to Lisa and Lynn and Lily for getting that answer correct. Now, it sounds like you had an amazing bird sighting with those cuckoos right at the point of trying to breed with Scott. We've got another bird here that's fairly rare. I'm going to shift forward a little bit. I think we've seen them a lot now. They've settled down on Impala Plains. We've got a little Senegal lapwing. And I think they must be nesting around here as well. Picking away at the various grass seeds. A bird, it's a lapwing that you actually don't see too often. We've been spoiled because they've been nesting here. But we don't always see them. I'm still trying to follow up on this leopard. I don't know where he's disappeared to. I've been checking all around, looping the area. But no sign of him so far. I know that Tingana likes this block up ahead of us. I know because I've followed him there and been stuck there in art bark holes. I'm going to head across there. But this is a perfect time of year to see some amazing bird behavior. Although at the moment, this lapwing is just just feeding. I wonder where their nest site is hiding. Alrighty, let's continue on. See what else we can find you to show you. I'm waiting to see if my Ellie Hurts come through. in terms of a bird that we haven't seen. Marco, you were mentioning that you haven't seen a Birchall's Kukul in a while. You're wondering if they're migratory birds. They're not, although you only really hear them calling around the rainy season. I've also been keeping an eye out for them. I think the reason you haven't seen them for quite a while on our live safaris is the fact that we've had so little rain. I think they've moved closer towards the rivers and the more permanent flowing water sources. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the Birchall's Kukul, it's also known as the rainbird because it always calls, supposedly always calls just before the first rains, although it quite often calls just afterwards as well. It's its breeding call, and that's the time when it breeds. But they are around. The drain or draining waiting to see if we can spot one. I think they've moved closer to the rivers though. As I continue my leopard search, we'll head back across to Scott who's exploring Arethusa. Let's find out what secrets Arethusa has to show you. great mix it's been this morning of some large high profile game like the African elephants as well as a lot of birds and for those of you who are new to the safari experience it's important to know that it's not just about the big animals out here it's often the smaller ones that we spend more time with and they are equally interesting just like that Incredible sighting we've had of the cuckoos and the babblers. Bird we 
Can you call him now? I think it's a brew brew. B R U B R U, but we're going to need to try and find it to double check that. There's a lot of birds jumping around these trees. So it's a bit of a bird party going on. Let's take a look around you and see if we can't work out who's who. Nothing to see initially as we scan this big knob thorn tree. While we wait, we can answer a question from Eddie Abbey. And I'm interested to know when will the babblers realize that they have been duped by the cuckoos? And it's before the cuckoos will even lay the egg. They know exactly what's going on. And what they were trying to do there is prevent the cuckoo from actually laying the egg in the nest. Once the cuckoo has laid the egg in the nest, well then the babblers can't do anything. And what's interesting is that they will continue to raise that cuckoo, which is a bigger bird than themselves. And the cuckoo chick will be bigger than its foster parents in a very short space of time. And they won't then stop feeding it, they will think it's one of their own, so they don't have the ability to work out that they have raised a chick to a point where they can then realize that it's not their own. They will continue to raise it until adulthood. So really interesting stuff, and I guess those babblers just knew that the cuckoos were intruding and they were trying to stop that intrusion from happening, and that's what we saw, but once, like I said, the egg is in the nest, the cuckoo's job is done. And what's interesting is that the cuckoos also give birth, <laughs> lay an egg, which is well developed and will therefore often hatch before the eggs of the foster parents or the hosts. So they highly specialized in design. They therefore probably do have the ability to withhold the egg for a certain amount of time. I'm not sure how long. And Barbara's interested to know the answer to that question. How long will they be able to hold their eggs for before giving birth? I'm not entirely sure, and I'm not even sure if the scientists know the answer to that question. There will be a limit though. They're not going to be able to withhold eggs just as humans and other mammals will not be able to hold back their baby from being born until the time that suits them. Well the large birds of prey that you can see, well that one there is a martial eagle I believe. It's a massive bird with a, me a wingspan of about two and a half meters. And it's not quite warm enough for it to be flapping or floating effortlessly and every now and then it has to beat its wings but that is a monster of the skies. It's just very, very far away. There's also a few very small birds, swifts and swallows, shooting through the screen, like little fighter jets. Great! Well, the burning continues. are specialists in depositing extra eggs into nests of other birds and now Lise is asking whether monkeys are responsible for plucking eggs out of these nests and yes monkeys and baboons will feed on both eggs and baby chicks they are omnivorous just like us and I actually heard about 
a baboon which caught a standby just a few days ago. Nikki's father's been in the Kruger Park with some friends and one of the members or one of the vehicles in their safari crew was fortunate or I guess unfortunate enough to see a baboon walking across one of the roads with a tiny baby stand back dangling out of its mouth. But so the primates out here are prone to the odd meaty meal and birds, eggs as well as chicks will be high up on their list of summer treats. to Janine and thank you for alerting my brain to the thought of snakes. Janine's interested to know if we've seen any snakes recently and I personally haven't seen one but I think Jandre saw a couple when he returned from leave just a few days before me a snouted cobra was one of those snakes as long, along with a few others. It definitely is snake season, Janine, and I'm guessing it won't be too long before we get lucky and spot one again. And on the topic of animals that eat birds, there's a strong chance that we will find a snake this summer with a bird kill. A lot of the snakes in this area are arboreal. The boom slung, the vine snake, the black mamba, and being arboreal, naturally it's a good place to feed on and catch birds. So that could well happen. Another thing that could happen is a bird could catch the snake. And there's a few eagles out here that would love to and quite happily attack, kill and feed on snakes as venomous as a lot of the snakes in this area may be. Another thing that we've been discussing a lot is birds' eggs and what may consume them and what may happen with the cuckoos laying their extra eggs in other birds' nests. And there are a few snakes out here which are specialized in eating eggs. And they'll swallow them whole. They've got two kind of tooth-like protrusions at the back of their head or the back of their mouth. And once they've swallowed the egg, the pressure of the kind of front mouth parts pushing the egg back against these tooth-like protrusions will break the egg. And that way allow the snake to crush and swallow an entire egg. Good morning, Zebra. Why are you holding your ears in such a funny position like that? You are looking quite sheepish. Have you been misbehaving yourself? It's the stallion of the sarum. Maybe the women are giving him a hard time this morning. Or well, possibly it's just the wind that he's trying to avoid listening to very clearly. It's quite windy here as you can see from the bushes in the background. And by flattening his ears like that he will be avoiding picking up the loud kind of wind that a lot of us would be aware of when speaking to somebody who's in a windy place on a cell phone I guess would be one way of thinking of it. Their hearing's so acute. You could kind of almost relate to the microphone of his phone picking up windy conditions. It's a place 
and they like to spend a lot of time here where we are on the Arethusa airstrip you can see perfectly short grass which zebra enjoy feeding on and it's also a safe place for them in open areas that then even though it's just a long thin strip either side of the airstrip it does provide a little safe haven for them they've got a really wonderful call that sadly they don't call out very often but it goes something a little bit like this and you can see by the stallion's immediate response there that I just wanted to double check that I wasn't another stallion coming in to try and steal one of his ladies and even though it's not the breeding season now and some of the females within this herd will probably give birth in the coming month or so and none of them look heavily pregnant maybe that's just me but even though it's not the breeding season he will still try and defend his harem as best as possible Dr. Debbie and on the topic of mating you would like to know which is the most interesting mating display or call I have seen Shoof. not an easy one tortoises are always good quality to watch but that's more humorous than anything else baboons are also quite interesting as they are very very vocal Oh, 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 is the noise that you'll hear when baboons mate which is absolutely wonderful I think so keep an eye out for that although we don't get to see baboons very often so that's probably not going to happen to you soon shame the foal that's just walked into the screen now has got an injury on its front left leg not too sure what it is, it just seems to be nursing it a little bit as it begins to try and nurse from its mother I think you're a bit too old to be drinking milk but the mother seems to be tolerating it surprisingly but there's a wide variety of interesting mates and calls the Cory Busted which you were speaking about earlier has got a beautiful display where it will erect a lot of its feathers on its back and front making it look like an inflatable kind of white balloon a lot of the birds have got the most impressive of mating displays some of the birds have also worth having a look at because they have got incredible mating displays to try and seduce the opposite sex One of the most impressive acts of mating that I've ever witnessed is that of the African elephant, Dr. Debbie. That, for me, is something that I'd love to see again. I've only seen it once. And it is basically a monument of love being made. It's possibly 10 tons of passion combined together. Speaking of passion, there doesn't seem to be too much passion going on with these zebras. I think we're going to continue before I fall asleep, along with the stallion. Wonderful animals though, the zebra. And I'm looking forward to seeing some 
young zebra foals, along with a lot of small animals that should be born in the coming weeks. Impalas, wildebeests, a lot of the herbivores are going to start giving birth. Some of you have either enjoyed or are continuing to discuss my impression of baboons mating, or the audio that you hear when they do so. I'm just going to try and find a way to best cross this airstrip. I'm not too sure what it is, so let's just head across here, look right and look left beforehand, make sure no airplanes are coming. That would be embarrassing. through on the topic of cuckoos and it can be applicable to a lot of other animals not only cuckoos and this is from Jennifer in Toronto and she would like to know how does this young cuckoo chick who is raised by foster parents then know what to do as an adult cuckoo and I guess like a lot of animals once it's been raised to adulthood, the most tricky part of their life is those initial stages where it needs to be fed and looked after, but thereafter instinct will kick in. And leopard, lion, a lot of the animals are not dissimilar to a young cuckoo. And even if a young leopard, for example, was raised by a pride of lion, once it grew up, its natural instincts would cause it to probably leave that pride and live a solitary life and go off and look for other leopards to mate with. Um, but it is a good question and certainly does make you think. But there's obviously nothing that its parents will have to do other than lay that egg in terms of raising it to adulthood. Thereafter, it's just going to know what to do through instinct, which is how most animals will operate. Most leopards won't necessarily get taught how to hunt by their parents, but they'll instinctively know to chase something that runs away from it. And even though time to time, you know, you get certain predators like the cheetah, which will hold on to prey that they've caught in order to teach their cubs what to do, even with, if without doing that you'd probably find cheetah cubs do have that natural instinct to chase something that runs away from it. <laughs> well, I think I've got myself into a tricky spot now after mimicking the baboons mating. Now Lisa's asking me to mimic the sound of tortoises mating and I'll have a crack at it. It's kind of like a wheezing squeak. It's like <coughs> it's lots of breathing. <laughs> but uh, again you may want to research elsewhere tortoises mating. If you would like to have a laugh, or compare it to my tortoise mating audio. Enough of the foolery now with me, and over to Jamie, who's hopefully got a slightly more serious topic for you. Well, my goodness me. Sounds as though Scott has been giving you quite the performance. Things I'm not going to do, I'm not going to imitate the noise buffalo make whilst mating before that request comes through. But shame, this old boy looks like he might be past that stage of life. Walking very slowly, his bones are quite prominent. 
he's an old man. I don't think those sorts of thoughts are on his mind anymore. He's looking for a nice cool place. I think he was trying to get hold of some mud. Fortunately for him, the Juma Dam is pretty much dry, although he could go up to the pan if he really wanted to. Now, I'm not sure, just as he was walking past, you might have seen there were a load of ox pickers on him and they're flying backwards and forwards from the water to him. And that is because, I think because he's slowly reaching the end of his health, his tick load must be much larger than other buffalo. And buffalo do have a lot of ticks on them. You can see he's walking with some degree of difficulty. Poor old boy. He's probably, I would say, quite close to being maybe 13, 14. You can see I'm going to shift around to the other side of the dam. I don't want to stress him out, obviously. But he is moving away from us, so I'll shift around to get us a better view. But he is, you can see as he struggles through. I can tell he's old, first of all, by the way, that he's walking, but also the fact that his horns are pretty chipped and broken. He's broken the tips off both of them. Let's see if we can get a nice view of him as he comes through onto the dam wall. I don't want to disturb him. I don't want to make him run or expend any energy. Oh. Bumpy, bumpy, bumpy. Hello, dam camera. Give it a quick wave. For those of you new to our live safaris or joining us for the first time, if you haven't heard from our regular viewers, if you're not watching our live drives, then you can watch the dam cameras that are up at Juma and Arethusa waterholes. And they broadcast 24-7. And now is a really good time. This time of year is a really good time to be watching them. It's unbelievably dry out here. And there's very little options in the way of water for the animals. So you're going to get a lot of amazing sightings on the dam cameras. Let's see if we can loop around and have a look at this gentleman. I'm also just waiting to see and keep your eyes peeled. I am sure that that elephant herd is going to come and have a drink at some stage today as it gets a little bit hotter. Oh, I'm very glad they fixed this road as well. They've made life a lot easier. And on a beautiful warm morning like today where there's not a cloud in the sky, is actually an unimaginable shade of blue and I remember trying to describe this feeling when I lived in England to try and describe the way an African sky feels so much bigger it doesn't feel like the sky is on top of you it's just this huge open space hello boy I'm not going to... Oh, Shane. Don't stress, boy. I'm not going to go any closer to him. I don't want to get him, make him nervous or feel like he has to expend more energy than he already has to. I wonder where the rest of the Duggar boys are. Usually these old gentlemen hang out with a group of them. But I think he's at the point where he can't quite keep up with the rest of the group. Is disappearing off. I'm going to continue on my search for wonderful things and I'm going to let our buffalo bull head off without disturbing him. But I believe Scott has a reptile to show you, so let's head across to him and I will be back with you in just a few moments. Oh, look at that. It just Got a little bit of a fright as the Cape turtle dove started calling behind us, I guess. This is a tree agama, also known as a blue-headed lizard. This is a female, however, and lacks the bright blue head. I guess you may be able to see a very slight tinge of blue on her head there, but the males, especially at this time of the year, will 
be sporting their bright blue head, their breeding coloration. And this one is relying on its incredible camouflage and I am convinced that it thinks we can't see it. They usually quite shy and secretive and if it had any idea that or any concern that we had spotted it, it would probably be able to run around onto the other side of this tree. Just scouting around, it's sitting in a marula tree and I'm hoping to see a male sunning itself nearby, but no luck. But I'm sure that in the coming weeks we will also get to show you the bright blue head of the male. Well, we're having great action this morning on safari from the large buffalo bull with Jamie now to this tiny little reptile. We've seen birds, we've seen mammals, some really interesting stuff going on. Sadly though, the clock is ticking. And we don't have too much time left of this sunrise safari, so let's keep moving and see what else we can stumble upon. Just an update on the Birmingham boys, they managed to catch a baby buffalo. Last night, or the early hours of this morning, I'm not too exactly sure when it went down. So that's good news that they've had a little meal. The other good news is, is that it's not a, a fully grown buffalo because that would have kept them anchored on Sibambili where we cannot go for longer than a baby buffalo will. So better prospects there. They are right on the northern fence line though, of the Savi Sands. But it's only about 700 meters, about half a mile from that northern boundary to the northern boundary of Arethusa where we can go. So possibly this evening they'll make their way into an area where we can view them. Failing that we may have some other lions pop up with all the action that's been going on at the moment. Just like yesterday we found the Birmingham's in the morning and the Salala Pride were seen mid-morning by somebody leaving Juma. So that was a very pleasant surprise for the afternoon. to Mercedes in California and Mercedes is interested to know that if the lioness that was with the Birmingham boys yesterday was from the Inkahuma pride, this is all hypothetically speaking, would the pride, the Inkahuma pride be accepted, the entire pride be accepted by the Birmingham boys on their next meeting. And yes, quite possibly the fact that one lioness is building bonds with those males may quite well be enough to allow the rest of the lioness within the, her pride to be accepted by them. I think that certainly is plausible. The only catch is that Junior, the young male, will definitely not tolerates it regardless of how good a relationship the lioness have forged with the Birmingham boys. So Junior essentially is just a ticking time bomb and the clock is ticking heavily against his favor. He's going to be in trouble sooner rather than later. Either out on his own trying to find a new area or other males to join up with or if he continues trying to fly below the radar with his natal pride, I think he is going to come unstuck. Anyway, it's interesting stuff and only time will tell.
Western Ghana went. So I think he may have a kill somewhere. We haven't found any more of his tracks. Well, we didn't earlier on this morning when we were looping around the area. Around kind of quarantine. So I want to go back there and see if we can't find any more clues as to where he may have gone. that you saw an elephant with a recurved tusk going in the wrong direction of Jamie and I wonder if it's the same one that we also saw a couple of weeks ago a very large tusk growing backwards also a beautiful elephant cow and I know some of you may have nicknamed her Fang interesting name for an elephant but happy to roll with it <laughs> um, Deb in Ohio is now asking whether I've ever seen an animal with any kind of deformity that actually through default acts or you know ends up benefiting the animal. So the animal adapts and learns how to use this deformity and use it to its advantage. And Deb, I can't think of anything that comes to mind immediately. Good news, we are going to send you across to Jamie, who's in a fortunate position with some more nesting birds. I know that you were discussing egg thieves and nest raiders with Scott, and here we have one of the biggest thieves. The African Harrier Hawk, I know you saw it on its nest yesterday with Scott, this is a very common specialized egg thief, which is why we see them so often mobbed by little birds like fork-tailed drongos, or even arrow-marked babblers like the ones that were fighting, the, fighting off the attentions of that cuckoo. You can see him shifting. This is a very shy bird for some reason. I mean, we've sat beneath the Wahlberg's eagles underneath their nests countless times, and they're more than happy with us. But this bird seems to prefer to have a little bit of distance. Now that we've had a good view of it with its bright yellow face, I'm going to try and roll forward sneakily and see if we can get a little bit closer and see a bit more detail on it. Come on, Wendy. Come on, Wendy. I don't know if this actually helps, but I'm pushing forward. Oh, by the way, the reason there is a guari bush now in my hair is because I'm hoping that will amplify the good luck to Bremen, as well as fighting off our oh, birdie gremlins. Oh well, I think he might head back. Where's he gonna go? Just stopped in that tree there. I'd actually forgotten I'd put the quarry bush in my hair until I st <laughs> until we went live. I just did it as a little bit of luck for myself. At the top there of the marula tree, the view's still not great, unfortunately. He's tucked himself away. Do you see him there, Ted? Well done. With those double-jointed knees, or ankle joints, that allow it to grip onto a branch with one claw and reach backwards and into all of those sneaky hidden tunnels that the birds hide their eggs in but not the most popular raptor out here in terms of its interactions with other birds. Don't think he wants to be seen though. Not going to come any closer. Still no sign of where Tingana might be hiding, if indeed it is Tingana. Done a couple of loops of that particular area and haven't managed to find him, but I'm going to continue and have a look down into the drainage lines because maybe that's where he's hiding out. It's starting to get much warmer, so he might be seeking out shade around the edges. Amazing how the temperature has increased from when we set out this morning to now.
interesting question, and I know Scott was discussing it earlier. We saw that elephant with a backwards facing tusk, and Deb has asked, have I ever seen an animal with a deformity that it could use to its advantage? I'm trying to think about it. That's a really interesting question because, of course, that's essentially evolution in action in its own way. A slight deformity might lead to an advantage unexpectedly. Oh, let me think. I've seen rhinos with very strange shaped horns, but I don't know if that helps them at all. Possibly what you could get, and that's not something I've seen, although I have seen plenty of deformed antelope horns, but that could be an advantage. I've never seen it in action, but it could be an advantage in that it's across to Scott. I will be back with you in my signal. Well, we're getting closer to the area where Tangana, I'm guessing Tangana, at least a large male leopard's tracks were moving. <clears throat> I'm scanning up in all the marula trees just to make sure that there's no kills. This is a good example of a marula tree up to our right over here. And the horizontal branches which you can see over here are ones that you would likely find a leopard sleeping on or somewhere in and around the forks of this tree you may find a kill wedged in out of the way of hyena and making it difficult for lion to steal. There doesn't appear to be any kills in this tree. You do actually have to look very carefully for kills in trees. They don't stick out as clearly as you'd think they would. It's not like a big bright red carcass hanging out of the tree, which would make our lives a lot easier. And what you should look for whilst scanning through a tree like this is kind of any obscurity is a branch growing straight down towards the ground, which naturally doesn't happen. Usually plants grow up towards the sun. So vertically facing downward branch could in fact be the leg of an impala or one of the prey items that a leopard may have killed. But I think it's safe to say that this marula tree is clear of any sign of leopards. But as we continue driving through this area, please do help me search and scan either up in the trees or wherever you're feeling lucky, really. It could be anywhere. question through from Chris in Arizona and he's wondering have I ever been in a scenario where whilst driving through the bush off-road or under any trees has a snake fallen into the vehicle and no it hasn't personally happened to me but I do know friends of mine who it's happened to you can imagine absolute pandemonium and chaos it's often when you're off-roading when that actually does happen and you typically off-road when you're looking at animals from the big five usually all of which are somewhat dangerous so you then get stuck in the scenario of having a snake in the vehicle and lions that you're following outside the vehicle so then what do you do it hasn't happened to me though interesting story about snakes though that I will tell you is that once I arrived at a waterhole for evening sundowners and I stopped and parked the vehicle next to a small bush, kind of like the one just on our left here. And I just asked Jandre to keep the camera there and I'm going to jump out quickly. When out on safari what you do is you stop for sundowners or actually morning coffee and all the morning coffee and cold drinks are kept on the back of the vehicle. So I jumped out the front of the vehicle, 
sets up the table ahead of the, the hood of the car and then myself and my tracker were walking between the bush and the vehicle kind of exactly how we park now to go and collect all the bits and pieces we needed from the back of the vehicle and as I walked the first time towards the back of the car I felt some kind of moisture hit me on the face so my natural instinct was to look up nothing peed on me so I carried on and thought I may have been losing my mind went back dropped off some bits and pieces in front of the vehicle and then went back to collect some more goodies and when that happened for the second time I got a full spray in my face thankfully I was still wearing my aviators my sunglasses which you don't ever see us wearing these days anyway um, and I realized oh no hang on this moisture isn't coming from above it's coming from this bush and as I looked closer into the bush I realized it was a Mozambican spitzing cobra that was spitting at me every time we walked past. So, some interesting things do happen, but thankfully snakes are more scared of us than we are scared of them. And that's something very important to remember. They will generally avoid us at all costs. And if we just stay out of their way as best as possible, they will tend to leave us alone. snakes we had a request earlier on from Anna Marie and she is hoping that we could find her a black bomber it's one of the most venomous snakes we find in this area neurotoxic venom that basically shuts down your organs causing you understandably to stop working with all your vital organs not working and We'd also like to know what they feed on mainly and they've got a wide variety of food that they'll feed on but birds as well as small rodents are going to be high up on their menu and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick up the speed a little bit we don't have much time so I don't think it's actually going to work out Anna Marie but there are or at least last summer there was uh, resident black mamba on the quarantine clearings that I saw a handful of times, only brief sightings. And we're not far from there, but I don't think close enough to go searching for it. And even that, the search would be an absolute miracle if we found them. I've said it once before, and I will say it again, that you do need to be careful about what you believe when watching documentaries on various channels as often they can be, be misleading and these supposed snake wranglers who pull snakes out of jungles that they're running through are often using snakes that have been pre-captured and released for them to catch so they're not slithering about around every corner What a great morning it's been, I hope you've all enjoyed it. A lot of great bird watching was had and I'm told that Leanne hiding in California is being a, bit, a little bit reluctant to start her bird list. So Leanne please come on, see if you can get to at least 50 birds and then call it quits when you get to 50. That's the least you can do for us, but give it a chance, I'm told you need some help getting onto the bird watching scene and it certainly is worth your while I promise you you will not regret it
Guys, thanks so much for joining us on Safari. Great work on camera, Jean-Dre, and well done to Tara for directing the show and Nikki for lending her hand. Jerry, thanks for joining us. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. The highlight for me was certainly having that big elephant bull coming right up to the vehicle and giving us a sniff early on. Over to Jamie, and we'll see you this afternoon. Well guys, it's been a morning where Wendy has been slightly plagued with gremlins every now and again, but I've still had a fantastic time being out and being out half an hour earlier. Now I have a quick request for you all. Please can you help me out with finding a bit more information. I know that Granny Joe, you wanted to know, Granny Billy Joe, you wanted to know more about that white-faced mongoose. Please help me out guys. Anyway, as we come to the end of our sunrise safari, a big thanks to Tebs and to Tara and Nikki and FC. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world and we will catch you later for the sunset safari. Have a great day everybody.